something that we use in here. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, so I've got to get uh, enough version of something. We're going to take the derivative of everything. Yeah. So this would be like a double derivative, double derivative, double derivative. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is okay. Because you give her your. Well, then we turn it into this, right? You can pull that one over C out. Yeah, no, I know. If, this, if you took the derivative of this again. No, no, but look, it's easier to work. This is just a so simple calculus question. I have all these new things. I'm just going to set them all in. Obviously, I have to get the reason for that. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. If just, just, well, I'm just going to walk through what I'm thinking. If you set them to this for all these major ones, these would no longer be derivatives anymore. They would all just be derivatives. Because you're going to the derivative of the integral. Well, that's what I'm going to do. You get i to four. Right, so really the only thing I would carry that can be is that L, L sub 1, I sub 1? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I'm All right, I guess it's one o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully, everybody's here for SolidWorks Workshop. I'm guessing a couple of people were just loading here. So, just as a heads up, every week, VMS is going to be leading a workshop from 1 to 3 in this lab. It should be posted on the calendar outside, but um, you know, if it's not too distracting for you, you're welcome to keep working in here, but we'll be kind of talking about SolidWorks for the next few weeks. Um, that being said, those of you who are here for VMS, um, let me just pull up the QR code to check in real quick here. I'll just pull up the drive, pull up one of the general meetings or something. Cool. You can go ahead and use that QR code to check in real quick to the workshop. That way we can keep track of who showed up today. Leave that up for a few more seconds here. <coughs> but kind of as an overview of what we're going to be going over today, we're barely even going to touch SolidWorks. We're going to be talking a lot about just kind of how to think about 3D objects um, and turn them into and basically tell the computer what to do um, in order to how to model them. Um, taking any kind of physical object in general, it's you usually have to deconstruct it into 2D shapes and lines and stuff like that. Sometimes you get into more complex geometry, it ends up being 3D, you know, equation-driven curves, that kind of stuff. Um, but we're basically just going to talk about different ways of looking at complex objects, um, turning them into 2D geometry that we can then draw in SOLIDWORKS and convert to 3D later on. 
I'll talk about a couple of other design principles like the difference between geometry, topography, um, and a couple of common ways of looking at um, you know, parts, stand, uh, like 3D projections and that kind of stuff. Um, everybody good on checking in? Cool. So I'll go ahead and take this away here. Um, cool. And I'll just leave a blank SOLIDWORKS window up for now. Cool. All right. So let's talk about taking a 3D object, turning it into you know, kind of... I should have brought some examples, I guess. Um, let's start with something simple like my phone here. So, again, 3D object, fairly rectangular in shape, right? So we can look at it from a couple of different angles, and you know, if, if I just kind of look at it from the side, I can see, all right, so my, my phone is kind of this big, long, hopefully that's a straight line, big, long rectangle. It has a couple of like little curves at the end here. Um, and that's kind of my general shape, right? And I can think about my critical dimensions here. So that's something that we're going to talk about a lot later on. Um, what defines this shape? What makes it this exact shape? You know, so we have you know, two parallel lines some distance apart. Another two parallel lines some distance apart over here. That designs that, you know, defines our basic shape. Um, and you know, maybe these are sharper angles. So there's probably an angle here that defines that. Um, we can kind of start to look at, you know, again, very simple shape. Kind of just looking from the side. That's how it gets broken down to start. Um, but then we look at, you know, something a little bit more complex, like we have these curves around the screen. Um, you know, looking at it kind of get, gets, again, trying to break things down, have a flat shape, curve at the end. Um, and when we start to look at how we want to define this kind of shape, you know, within SOLIDWORKS, um, we might not want to necessarily try to pick out this dimension, right? It's going to be kind of hard to figure out exactly where that curve starts. So one of the things that you want to keep in mind is try to keep your dimensions kind of out to the outside. You have big main dimensions that are easy to measure, especially when you're modeling a part that's already you know kind of in phys physically in existence. You want to think about all right, this part's this wide, and then we have this curve that kind of comes in from that. Um, so that's kind of you know, very very simple stuff. Um, and then moving on to let's say we had a cup, right? Let's draw kind of a fairly 3D kind of shape of a cup, right? So we start with something that looks like that. A little bit harder. Um, so it's a circular shape. So it's not, you know, if we look at it from the side, you know, maybe we see something that just looks like you know, a box or a trapezoid. Um, but how do we turn that into 3D geometry? Anybody take any guess? Is this like AutoCAD? Close, maybe, yeah. Rotate around the axis. Rotate around. So we have to define an axis. An axis isn't a physical part on this on this cup. We have to figure out kind of where you know this round geometry comes through, um, and so usually it's right down the middle of the circle, right? Um, and so we'll, what we'll do is we'll draw that here too, cut away this part because that's basically just a mirror image. You don't even necessarily have to draw it. And now we have you know we have one radius here, r1, and another radius here, r2, um, and then we have a height h. So now we just broke down this round shape that. You know, doesn't even have a consistent radius all the way up into three main dimensions that we can then rotate around and create a cup. Um, you know, if we had a little step in here, do the same thing. We have you know, a radius here, a little distance there, another radius up there, different heights. We can you know, break down these round kind of objects as well into 2G, 2D geometry. And that's usually what you want to do in SOLIDWORKS. You want to take any kind of geometry and break it down to simple. Um, 2D lines with as few dimensions usually as possible. You don't want to, um, like again, this part here, um, you probably want to define everything from the center line over. Like just measure this part. This part's going to be, you know, assuming that these are vertical, this is going to be the same distance away. You don't need to define this part here and kind of measure all that. Probably take an overall height, maybe one height here. Um, again, kind of trying to minimize those dimensions. Um, so that's kind of the basics of it. Um, you have round shapes and square shapes usually, but then sometimes you get more complex geometry, which I'll talk about kind of a few weeks down the line. But wanted to get you guys thinking about how to kind of model something that looks like this. Anybody want to take any guesses of where I can kind of draw geometry on this? I'd probably do an extrusion on the bottom. Um, so like the bottom base is wider. And then I would um, extrude on the top, making the, the base of the mouse. Okay. And then add in my um, 
Mike Phillips and all. Right. But I mean, this is a fairly curved object. You know, it's very hard to, to do these very, like with, with what you're talking about, which is an extrude. You can really only make, you know, we'll talk about it a little more once we actually get into SolidWorks itself, but you're really just extru extruding a constant cross section through. Um, so, you know, again, like going back to the phone example, this is a cross section. You know, we can see from the side view, you can actually see what the phone is like for, you know, a good 80 to 90 percent of the part. It's not really going to be the same thing here. This part changes its cross section a lot going all the way through. Um, so we could do it a couple ways. We could draw a cross section every, you know, every so often, every 5, 10 millimeter. Um, but anybody have other ideas? You could draw like multiple. Uh, to do drawings of each side, right? Yeah, so let's kind of get into like the 3D or 3 view projections. But yeah, um, and I'll kind of spoil my, or go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Go and for it. You cut it like down the center and then um, sketch out the exterior frame of the and then mirror it. Potentially, and it's not really a symmetric part either. You can see it's lifted on this side and kind of drop down on the other side. Um, I'll kind of spoil it in that we can we can actually describe these 3D lines. So usually we want to actually say, hey, this is a line that I can define, that I know where each point along that line is. And like here, it kind of can't really tell. So I'm going to kind of pick these lines that define the geometry of it, and then I'm going to draw those lines in, and then I'm going to make the, the kind of stuff that goes in between. Um, again, not a constant cross section, so it's a little bit harder to do. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the idea. Sometimes we have cross-section parts, sometimes we have parts that don't have a constant cross-section, and those parts are the ones that are usually the toughest parts to model within SolidWorks. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say about 90% of the parts you're going to build on the team um, are going to have some kind of cross-sectional geometry that you can you know, extrude, revolve, um, or sweep, which is what we'll talk about later on. Um, but, um, so that's kind of, just kind of get, keep thinking about that as we go through. Um, we'll talk a little bit about geometry and topography. Um, I apologize in advance, this lesson might be kind of all over the place today. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that I kind of want to cover. Hopefully, oh yes, there you go, Grace. Sweet. All right, so in general, we're going to kind of talk about high level what SolidWorks does behind the scenes. Um, there's two different ways of describing parts. There's geometry and there's topography. So geometry is actually the physical, like what the object looks like. So if I have a box, we'll, we'll just start with a box, right? Um, each of these sides has a length, an angle, um, a relation with another one, like this is vertical, this might be horizontal, or along an x-axis, a y-axis, z-axis, however you want to define your coordinate system, right? Um, but SolidWorks doesn't really, I mean, it kind of cares about geometry, but the way that it actually does stuff behind the scenes is, uh, is about a concept called topology. So this, um, while it you know, has certain geometries, it has six faces, eight edges, and 12 corners. And what it actually defines are those corners, the edges, and you know, kind of the geometry of the faces. So these are all flat faces. These go you know, just between two points. They're straight lines. Um, they're not splines or anything like that. Um, but this box has the same exact topology as this box, right? Assuming again that all those lines are straight. Um, and also, it has the same topology as, I'm going to try to draw this as best as I can, something that has a small cross section up front and a bigger cross section in the back, right? Again, same thing six faces, eight edges, 12 points. And those points are what we try to um, define in space. Um, same thing with those edges. You know, we try to constrain those lines so that you know this is a vertical line going between these two points, and the and the dimension between those two points um, is you know this particular value. Um, and you know, if there's a curvature, we assign a curvature to that line. Um, otherwise, it's straight. It could be parallel to another line. There's a lot of different kind of relations that we can add to change our topology um, into fixed geometry. Um, so that kind of introduces a concept within SolidWorks called uh, defining your sketch. Um, so let's say that I go into SolidWorks. I might actually do this, um, you know, live here. Let's actually pop into SolidWorks. Um, I'm just going to create a new part here. Uh, when you say 12 points, you mean are you, you're talking about the sides? Um, or sorry, I meant 12, 12, 12 edges points. and 8 points. So the, the okay. corners. Um, sorry, I got those two backwards there. Thanks for catching that. All right, so I'm going to create a new part here real quick. 
going to take a little while. I'm running a bunch of stuff at the same time. Um, so this is kind of what SOLIDWORKS looks like. We'll go into a little bit more in depth, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start sketching here on the top plane. Um, and just to kind of bring up this idea again. Boom, I got four lines here, right? So SOLIDWORKS is going to treat these four lines the same way as it treats them that way, and that way, and that way until I start defining kind of the geometry of those lines. So again, I sketched out the topology. Um, let's say I want this line here to be vertical, right? All right, now I'm starting to define stuff. Um, this line now has this little green box here that says that line, you know, it's always going to be vertical. No matter how much I drag these points around, that line is going to stay vertical. Um, and let's say just to ease things up, I'm going to make this point, you know, every single part's going to have an origin. So I'm going to make it right on that origin. It's always going to be there, right? Cool. So now I can start defining some other stuff. Let's say that I want this line to be, again, a specific angle. Um, let's say between those two, we'll make it 115 degrees. Um, and what you're going to start to notice is that these lines start to kind of change color. So these lines originally, when I drew them and they were just topologically defined, um, they were blue. Um, and that's what SOLIDWORKS calls underdefined. You can see in my bottom, the bottom of my screen here, it's going to say underdefined. Um, and that means that this sketch still has points and lines and other topographical elements that can move around um, however they want. Um, they're not, you know, the geometry isn't defined on this. Um, another thing you'll start to see is as I drag these points around, right next to my cursor, SOLIDWORKS starts to infer some of the geometry that I might want. So that little horizontal line means that, I, you know, maybe you know, this line's pretty close to horizontal. Maybe I actually want it to be horizontal, right? Um, and then same thing with the other line. As I drag it around, boom, snaps to vertical. Doesn't actually define anything. It just shows me kind of, hey, if, if this is what I wanted my part to look like um, and make that, you know, vertical, you know, this part here vertical, um, that part horizontal, you know, this is kind of what it would be. And it snaps it in there for me. So as I'm sketching my topography and just kind of drawing stuff out, um, it kind of stays roughly what I what I want it to be like. Sometimes SolidWorks will add in that uh, those what we call relations, like the little green box I was showing you over here. You know, there's a vertical relation. Um, sometimes it'll add those in automatically for you. Sometimes you have to go in, kind of like we were just doing, dragging that point around. It still, technically doesn't have any relations. Look at the top left here. Existing relations box doesn't have anything, but I can just click and make it vertical, and this one horizontal. All right, so now my geometry or my topography is a little bit more defined. You know, I have horizontal vertical lines. Um, actually, that one I haven't defined as horizontal. There we go. Now I have horizontal vertical lines, I have an angle, um, but again, my geometry isn't fully defined yet. Those two lines still can move around and change shapes. Um, so I can actually add, again, specific values. You know, say this should be 70 millimeters and this one should be 50 millimeters, right? And now we have a sketch where all of my lines are colored in black, not in blue. Bottom of my screen is going to say fully defined. So again, it's kind of that kind of that distinction. You have all of your lines. They all start to, you know, SOLIDWORKS is still treating this the same way um, you know, in terms of where these lines get put. It's still treating them kind of the same way as when I first drew the sketch. There's just four points that I plopped in and four lines that connect them. Um, and then there's a separate process that it goes through to say, all right, this line is actually going to be vertical. This line is going to have a value of 70 millimeters long. Um, and then this other one's going to be 50 millimeters long. And it's going to be horizontal. And it's going to you know, be coincident at this point here. Um, it's not going to be floating somewhere out here. So it kind of goes through all those steps um, in order to, again, change our geometry or our, our topology and kind of what, what the part looks like into how big that part actually is and how big each of those features are. Um, does anybody have any questions on that kind of distinction? Cool. So one of the one of the big things um, that this kind of introduces um, is that we always want to have, you know, as much as possible, we want to have our sketches be fully defined. We don't want to have any undefined geometry, any of those blue lines that we can just drag around, move around, and aren't specifically defined in space. Um, and as you can see, this sketch is fairly simple. You know, it doesn't take much here. You know, just you know, had a few lines. I had to make sure that they had vertical relations on them, and then I went through and dimensioned my parts with the critical dimensions. You know, maybe those that 70 and 50 millimeters are both critical dimensions that you know have to interface with other parts um, you know, in the car. 
or somewhere else. Um, but you know, again, let's try to keep it simple. I didn't have to go through and dimension you know this line, that line, that line, that line. I just had to make sure that they were all vertical, right? Or the angles in between, angles in between them. Um, right. So um, kind of close out of this. Don't need to save it or anything like that. Um, and then I want to bring in. I guess we can talk about. I think this part's still available. Yeah, cool. So this is a little bit more complicated of a part that I designed um, last year for the car. It's a steering wheel. Um, and you, know, you can see here on the left, it's got a lot of different features in there that make up this part. Um, we're not really going to go into all this stuff quite yet, but one of the things that I did want to introduce is one of the most common ways that you're going to see uh, parts presented to you, um, especially if you're like in manufacturing. Uh, most commonly, you're going to see these parts given to you as a three-view projection. That's kind of the standard of making drawings. So I'll go ahead and make a drawing from this part here. Um, I guess I'll show this window. It's off my screen right now. But you know, I'll make a new drawing here. Pick a random sheet size, whatever. Um, the important thing here, I'm going to drag in a standard three-view. Yeah, come on. So, all right, so this is what you'll see a lot of parts um, get shown as. Uh, let me just make the scale on this a little bit bigger. There it is. All right, but in general, you're going to see parts and drawings and stuff that look like this. Um, has anybody seen parts displayed in this way before? Cool. All right, so basically, Main main one right here is our front view, this is our side view, and this is our top view. And they're kind of constrained. You can kind of see that line that comes through there right in the middle. Kind of going to be, you know, might be a little hard to see. But it basically shows that, you know, this part is still aligned along that kind of plane. So the plane that would divide the part in half. Um, and so this way, you know, all the stuff is drawn in um, orthographic, orthographically, and so there's no, like, you know, uh, no drawing of uh, perspective. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, and you can, you know, you can kind of go through and dimension all your critical parts here. Um, but it's, again, it's the most common way you're going to see a lot of parts, and it's a good practice to get into. Like, let's say that I'm just coming up with my concept sketch. Um, let's say for my upright. Um, so this is the part on the suspension that uh, I kind of connects the wheel to the A arms, right? So I'm just going to draw like a front view of it, right? I'm going to have this kind of dimension here. Um, I'm going to have a couple of holes up top. You know, I'm going to dimension them. You know, I'm just starting to come up with ideas. And then maybe if I want to kind of, again, this might be just a concept that I'm showing my, my lead to start off. Um, I'll draw something off to the side that kind of starts to show, you know, hey, this isn't just a completely rectangular part. It actually tapers off. We have a little thinner section up here. And the part where the wheel goes through is a little bit thicker. We give it some more support. We have two bearings in there, so I can maybe draw in now, hey, there's going to be a hole coming through here, um, and a couple other things. But um, in general, we can you know, we can kind of see all these. You know, again, the 3D projection is the most common way that you're going to see a lot of parts, um, and it's you know for for fairly rectangular objects or I guess you know constant cross section from front, right, and top. Um, this is one of the best ways to kind of look at parts and kind of start to think. All right, you know, I'm going to model this eraser. Let me look at it. From the, you know, from the front, from the top, from the side. From those three, I can usually gather almost everything that I need. Sometimes I might need to take a look at the bottom. And if the bottom maybe has some kind of detail on it, I'll add in another view and kind of take a look at it from the other side. Um, yeah, so again, again, fairly, you know, constant cross-section stuff. You can do this. Um, if you have detail, you can add in you know, detail views. We'll get fairly in-depth into drawings at a later date. Um, but I just want to introduce this again. It's kind of a way to think about how do I turn these complex looking objects into, you know, sketch geometry. And that's actually exactly what I did when I built this part. So I'll swap over real quick and just show you guys here. <laughs> this is the very first sketch I made on this part. And it just shows, all right, here's the center of my steering wheel. Here's where I want my buttons. You know, they're going to be up here. Here's where this you know, mounts to my steering wheel quick release. And I want that to be 72 millimeters in diameter to make sure that I have enough, you know, a, a good mounting face. I dimension all my holes and everything like that. 
um, and kind of distinguish this part here um, so that it shows, hey, this, this is actually going to be on a separate face. Um, again, kind of going back to uh, discard changes. I don't think I make, made any. So you can see that face right there is a little bit offset from that one. It's a little bit indented. But again, that's the first thing I did when I went in. I kind of drew in my concept, laid out where everything's going to be, and that's a you know that's a that's a fairly good way. We're going to talk about here in a second of the top down versus bottom up modeling strategies. Um, that's a fairly good way to kind of plan out your part ahead of time. Just have one main sketch, um, or maybe a couple main sketches, one from each side that kind of define, hey, this is where my geometry is in space. These are my critical parts um, and where they need to go, um, and then start modeling from there. Um, Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to kind of talk about with this model so far. Um, again, yeah, just having those couple of sketches. I think for the hand grip itself, um, yeah, I pretty much, yeah, I just went right off that sketch and then later on for the outside of the hand grip, you know, because that was kind of my main defining part there. I just drew another sketch on the front plane to say, hey, you know, kind of following off that first one. Here's where the outside of my part needs to be because that's actually what was constraining us. Um, you know, the steering wheel couldn't be bigger than a certain size, otherwise the chassis had to move the roll hoop up to make room for the driver's legs. Um, so we actually constrained it and we're like, all right, this is the maximum radius we want so our roll hoop doesn't have to move. Um, and then from there I went about designing the grips um, to kind of fit driver's hands. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of, that's all that I wanted to show for now here. Um, and then we can kind of st start talk about strategy again. So we've we've kind of briefly covered how to um, how to talk about or how how to convert parts from you know, virtual or real life into starting to look at TV sketches um, and like geometry, topography, that kind of stuff. And can start to talk about our strategy when we go about modeling complex parts. Um, so there's two main kinds of you know strategies. Uh, we call them top-down modeling and bottom-up. Um, and top-down, we'll kind of think about, oh shoot, what do I want to think? Well, the steering wheel is actually a good example of this. Um, but basically we have one file that has multiple parts within it. So there's actually two parts in this file. There's the front and the back half of it. Um, but they share a lot of the same geometries and a lot of the same design parameters. Um, so top-down modeling is really good for heavily integrated systems. So where you have a lot of parts that all inter interdepend on each other, or maybe you know, if you think about a, a part that's made up of several subcomponents, um, and you really want to think about them as components and not really of, as their own parts, right? We don't want to model the whole car in this one big part file um, and have all these little interdependencies. Um, at some point, you kind of have to draw the line and say, hey, this is an upright. I want it to just be an upright. And I'll model the bearings inside of it, maybe you know, kind of just to just to give you a reference or a steering wheel. It's one steering wheel, but it has two parts inside of it. it has some electrical components and other stuff that we can add in maybe later. Um, but bottom up is the opposite. You model each individual part as it's, uh, on its own. So these are standalone parts that you want to look at. So standalone parts. The hard part here um, is, is kind of drawing the line of where your critical design dimensions start to kind of affect each other. So here, again, remember the, the steering wheel, the main outside diameter was, or the, the outside radius, um, was what was kind of defining most of the shape. Um, and so since it defined both the front and the back, and then kind of the geometry of the steering wheel, the steering wheel front, um, controlled the geometry of the back, um, and you want your critical design dimensions to both carry through, so critical dimensions. Um, and then bottom up, you kind of have a couple of critical dimensions that might carry through. Um, a good example of kind of where we do bottom up on the car is suspension and chassis. Um, so suspension is very concerned with kind of the motion of the, the control arms. Um, and those control arms have to mount to somewhere on the chassis. Um, but that's really the only thing that matters. It's just those two mounting points for each of the control arms. Um, and for the control arms themselves, there's a lot of, you know, kind of part modeling and, and kinematic studies that have to go on. And it really doesn't make sense to put all that stuff together with the chassis in one part file um, where you can just kind of mess around with just the, the A-arms themselves. 
the key thing there, again, you, those critical dimensions have to be communicated between the two people. Um, so the parts are all built standalone, but critical dimensions are communicated. communicated. Um, and we'll kind of talk later about how to kind of integrate those into your part file and make it easy to access those. Um, communicate in the, here I guess I'll put critical dimensions integrated into the part itself. Um, does that kind of make sense? Is that a high level overview? Um, and we'll kind of go through again some more, some, some further in-depth uh, examples later on. Uh, but kind of when you're looking at what you're designing for your subsystem, kind of think about, hey, how far in depth do I have to go with modeling all these separate parts? Um, do I want to model all the bolts in this part itself, or do I want to add those bolts in later at an assembly stage where I'm putting a bunch of parts into one file? Um, and I guess that kind of brings me to talking about parts and assemblies. Probably should have talked about that before I distinguish between top down and bottom up. Uh, we have three different kinds of file types or main file types in SOLIDWORKS. Um, there's part. Assembly, and then we have drawings, right? So we've kind of briefly looked at drawings earlier with the steering wheel, um, but part is where you're going to be defining all of your features and constructing all your topology and ge uh, geometry. Assembly is where you're going to be interfacing those, so you're going to be taking a bunch of parts together and um, kind of defining where those parts are relative to each other in space. Um, so, like, you know, let's say putting my wheel on my upright, um, I'm going to have a central axis that's the same between the two of those. So we're going to do what we call mating parts. So we say these two parts share an axis. Those, you know, kind of combine them together or mate the two axes together. Um, and then if there's a bolt hole that goes through, you know, both the wheel and the uh, the upper or the the hub, I guess it would be. You know, we're going to put a fastener through there and kind of constrain it that way. Um, but again, that's stuff that you don't really want to model. Um, you know, in a top-down kind of way. You don't, your wheel is going to be complete, fairly separate from your hub design. It's just sharing a bolt pattern. But a lot of the stuff that you're concerned about when you're designing a wheel is very different from what that when you're con, you know, designing a hub. Um, so it's kind of about finding that line uh, of where to you know, go top-down and integrate parts into your, or in, integrate stuff into your part file um, versus going assembly heavy. So that's kind of another one of the distinctions. So the wheel would be bottom up. Kind of. So yeah, the outboard assembly is part bottom up. Um, you have your wheel separate from your upright, separate from your hub, um, and then but you know you can think about your brake rotor for example. Brake rotor mounts to your hub, and it doesn't really mount to anything else, um, and it's a fairly simple shape. You might want to model that brake rotor right within your hub, and just say, hey, I'm going to you know kind of model again to kind of draw somewhat decently here. Gonna have a hub in the middle. Gonna have probably four years or something like that come out. Have little things on the end, connect to the rotor. Um, and other than that, you know, there's kind of gonna be some material removal, removal here. Um, but this dimension here is defined by how big your wheel is on the inside, and then you know, your hub geometry is there. And other than that, the brake disc is a fairly simple part. Doesn't necessarily have to be its own standalone part. You can just integrate it right within the hub part itself to just save yourself a little bit of trouble. Um, with communicating kind of where, you know, what this whole pattern looks like to mount the brake rotor. Um, you can save yourself a little bit of time there. Um, that doesn't, you know, um, one of the other things I guess I should point out, you can always move from top down to bottom up. Um, and you can't really, and you can also move from bottom up to top down. So you can kind of integrate your parts together um, and you can separate them out as well. Um, so like the steering wheel part here, I actually split it up into the two parts within the part file. I exported each of those separately, and then I went through designing molds for each of them too. Um, so that, and that was a separate process from the actual part design itself. So you can, you can go kind of, you can start with your top down steering wheel, split it up, and do a little bit of bottom up design, you know, design a mold for the top part and design a mold for the bottom half as well. Um, so you can, you can go between the two of them. It's just kind of your strategy of how you approach the part itself. How much of that geometry you, do you want to include and focus on all concurrently in one part file? And how much of it do you want to spread out and just focus on the upright first, then build a hub that matches your upright specifications, and then build a brake disc that matches your hub, and build a wheel center that matches both of those as well. So um, that's also kind of something that goes into bottom-up design. 
top down, you have to consider everything at the same time because you're building a highly integrated system. You have to consider all of your dimensions all up front. Um, and bottom up, you can kind of build a hierarchy. You can start designing your important parts that are going to define what some of those critical, um, sorry, critical dimensions are. And then you can go from there and say, hey, you know, now my upright's fairly well designed. I know what my critical dimensions are. I know how far my bearings are going to be apart. I know what size they are. Start designing a hub that's going to fit that. Um, with bottom or with top down, you kind of have to know a lot of that up front. Um, any other questions about this? Cool. Um, let's see here. So I talked about top down, bottom up, parts, assemblies, and drawings. Um, and we'll go fairly in depth into those at later dates. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the other thing that I should say is that, um, you know, kind of going from parts to drawings, fairly simple processes I kind of showed you before. You just drop in the views. You can kind of make section cuts and stuff like that. You can always do the same thing with assemblies, too. Um, but your functionality kind of is, the, or your drawings look different for assemblies than they do for parts. Kind of makes sense, right? You're, if you're making a drawing for a part, usually doing that to get the part manufactured. Sending this off to somebody, you know, who's going to go through and mill this part out of a block of aluminum. So you're like, all right, this part needs to be this dimension here, this diameter hole, um, this bolt pattern, whatever else. Assembly drawings are usually a little bit different in that they're focused on the assembly of a part. So putting it together, um, you have a lot of stuff that looks like, hey, here's this exploded view here. Here's how you, you know, here's the order that you put them all together. Here's the list of all the parts that are in this assembly. Here's so many bolts, washers, nuts you need, all that kind of stuff. Um, so your drawing's gonna look a little bit different based on your, whether you're making a part or an assembly. Um, but that's really, kind of it in terms of the high level stuff. Um, let's kind of go and kind of switch gears here. We'll kind of look at the um, the actual SOLIDWORKS interface itself. Because I know that when I was giving my examples earlier, kind of breezed through a lot of stuff. So let's see if I can close out of these. Cool. So we'll kind of start with the, the blank SOLIDWORKS screen here. Um, and we'll go ahead and create a new part. Um, and unfortunately, it looks like on the live stream, it's not even showing me that. Um, it's not showing me this part window here. But um, basically, for any SOLIDWORKS install, you're going to have a couple of different options here. You can create a part, assembly, or a drawing. Um, later on, you can go through and create your own kind of custom templates. Um, and if you're doing kind of training files through SOLIDWORKS, they'll give you, you know, a part template that's in inches, one that's in millimeters, assembly templates, and then a bunch of different drawing size templates as well. Um, but really, this is all you really need. You need to be able to create a part, assembly, or a drawing. We'll start with part. So after we click new part, it's going to take us. Let me take a couple seconds here. Maybe. Try that again. Cool. All right. So we're looking at our part file here. Um, I have a couple of things to kind of talk about in terms of UI. Similar to like Microsoft Suite, you have a, a kind of taskbar up here that shows you all of your buttons, all the different things you can do. Um, this is customizable, so you can kind of adjust stuff. You can add in a bunch of different stuff here. Um, kind of pull this up to that screen. Maybe I should add. <laughs> going to work. All right. So basically, I can customize this with kind of any and all the extensive features that SOLIDWORKS has to offer. And you can kind of see as I scroll through a lot of this stuff, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that SOLIDWORKS can do. There's you know, cam operations, so actually machining stuff now that they've added in, um, spline control tools, surfacing structures, you know, kind of all your basic stuff. Um, drawing parts, whatever. So you can customize these and we'll talk about, you know, my, my SOLIDWORKS is actually fairly standard. I've only added a couple of things in um, just because I've gotten used to how SOLIDWORKS operates. A lot of people will just kind of tailor SOLIDWORKS to how they would like to work. Um, but yeah, so it's it's fairly standard. You're mostly going to see some something that looks similar to this except for all these toolbars that I've added in. So um, most likely you won't see sheet metal, surfaces, mold tools, weldments. So basically these are all different areas of SOLIDWORKS 
um, and different kind of categories of things that we can do. Um, like we can do simulation stuff. There's a whole toolbar with specific features that you're commonly going to use for simulation. Um, if I want to do, like let's say I want to work with sheet metal, there's a certain array of tools that help out with sheet metal, so they're all going to be in one spot for you here. Might be a couple things that you might need to add that are a little bit more hidden, more advanced, depending on what you come into. Um, but the sketch toolbar is probably where you're going to spend most of your time, um, as well as the features toolbar. So we'll kind of talk about going from left to right here. First button here creates a sketch. You got your dimensioning tool, super important. And then you got your basic geometry all in here. Lines, circles, rectangles, arcs, ellipses, splines, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you have operations that you can do on those. You can trim them, you can convert them. So if you have some geometry that's already there, you want to convert it into your sketch, push that button to convert it. Um, offset and you know, kind of all this other stuff here. So that's kind of, you know, this is mostly what you're going to be spending your time in up here. Um, and then features, this is basically how you convert those 2D geometries into 3D objects again. So if you remember that cup example that we did earlier, take that geometry, you do a revolve boss um, is what it's called. Um, and then you could also extrude it if you're making more of a rectangular or a constant cross-sectional um, geometry. Um, and then you have other options. You can cut away geometry, you can make holes. Um, there's a bunch of options. They're all grayed out right now because we don't have any geometry built into the part right now. We don't have a sketch active right now. Um, but again, these two common ones right here that you're going to start with most likely when you start a part, they're kind of available for you. So let's say that I want, I know, you know, opening up a part, and I know that my basic geometry is going to be an extruded. So something with a constant cross section. Then brings me to these three planes here. Um, and these are my three reference planes. It's every single part is going to have them. Um, and it kind of goes back to that three view projection, looking at the part from the front, from the top, and from the right side usually. Um, so they'll have all those three all in there, all centered around the origin. Um, so you can kind of see where all those lines meet up. Those are your, this one here is going to be your X axis, Y axis, and your Z axis coming out towards us. Um, and you can also see in the bottom left hand corner here, you have uh, your triad, so it's your basic coordinate system that it's establishing for you. Um, and that basically shows you, again, you kind of get lost in your parts, all spun around, kind of all wacky, like, oh, all right, now I'm kind of facing, looking at it from the bottom, spin it around, um, and then I can get to my top plane, let's say, if I wanted to draw a sketch on there. Um, then by hitting the space bar, I can bring up this cube here. So, again, kind of navigating around the part, I can kind of look around it, um, it's a good way also if you kind of travel off to the side of the screen or like zoom in or zoom out too far, uh, bring the space bar kind of zooms the part towards your screen. Um, and then you can click on any of these predefined views. I guess it might be a little bit simpler if I had a part open um, to kind of visualize that. So let's see if I can open something up. Just open up my roll cage here. Cool. So again, let's say that I zoom off way out here, lose track of my part push the space bar, brings me back to that cube. And then let's say that I wanted to look at it from the right, click on that right plane, brings me right to it. Um, and you kind of look at it, spin it around. Um, right now I'm holding on the mouse button or the middle mouse button to drag it around. Um, right click is a fairly interesting feature that SolidWorks added in. Um, kind of try to show it here, it's called mouse gestures. Um, and these adapt based on where you are in your part. I pretty much rarely ever use these, but if you ever like, you know, press a button and your part randomly spins around, that's why. It's because it's giving you these little gestures. And when you're not, you know, doing anything like you're not within a sketch or something like that, it usually defaults to these guys here. So, top view, right view, um, bottom view, left, right. So, um, dragging around, middle mouse button, kind of spins it around. Then control middle mouse, pans it. Um, and then scroll wheels in, in and out. So that's basic navigation of a part. Um, and again, that space bar is super handy for getting to those views. Let's say that I want to look at it from the back. You know, if I try to click on the back face here, it kind of puts it off to the side so I can um, get to it a little bit easier. Um, then it's also available from up here, right in the middle of this top little tiny toolbar, brings that up as well. You also have a couple of other options here. Um, so what I've done here specifically for this part is I created a, a plane that's normal to my main roll hoop because it's at an angle here. You can see that that's tilted back 10 degrees and there was some stuff that I really needed to look at or to kind of create a drawing view 
um, actually that was off to that. So you can actually predefine or view views, or if there's like a certain angle that you really like for renders, move your part to there, save that as a view. Um, and it's also, I believe it's also accessible from the spacebar menu. Actually, no, it is not. So that's only accessible through here, um, bringing that up. And again, that's kind of where I add that in the new view button. Um, then you have options to show how you display your part as well. So I can change it to a wireframe, see all those hidden edges of where my tubes join up. Uh, if that's something that I really wanted to look at, change it to kind of hidden edge, edges shaded. So it makes it a little bit less cluttered. Um, and then going forward, no hidden edges visible, shaded with no edges, and then shaded with edges. Um, there is a slight kind of performance tick on it. If you start to, again, kind of shaded with edges is one of the kind of highest performance degrading parts. So if, you, you know, if you're running a little bit slow, you might consider just switching over to shaded or just a, you know, kind of a wireframe view with uh, no shading, um, but all the edges still visible. Um, but for the most part, the computers we're using here and the ones in the lab um, should be fairly capable of running it, or also if you have your own computer with a, mostly with a dedicated graphics card, even if it is a, you know, like a gaming laptop, that dedicated graphics card is going to help out a lot um, with taking care of like real-time uh, view panning and that kind of stuff, and rendering your part in real-time. Um, let's see, what else is there to cover? Um, a couple other like kind of view tools that I don't really use too often, but are kind of nice to know about. Zoom to area. So if, let's say that I really wanted to zoom in on that part. It's kind of window selected and it brings that to the center of my screen. Zoom to fit. Also a good one. Um, that kind of just brings everything towards your screen. Again, if you kind of get lost in part of your you know, super deep or super far away from your part. Um, and section view is the other one that I guess I should point out as well. One to cut through my part. You know, probably not too useful for this roll cage here, but for a more complicated part, if I want to see through it, um, kind of cut through and see some geometry that might have been hidden away by something else. I can kind of drag this plane through, click OK, and now I'm looking at a section view. Just click up top to kind of exit out of that again. Um, but that's your basic kind of part user interface. And you have your toolbars up here, have your view control is mostly what this is concerned with. Um, I guess this is another one to, to point out here, the hide show items. Um, it shows you kind of this is by default what it'll all show you show you know show planes if you have planes visible it'll show them you can turn it off if you just you want to turn off all the visibility of all your reference planes that you put into your part just turn them all off um, also hide show primary planes so that again those are my front right and top planes that I started out with um, show them or hide, hide or show them temporary axes these are all the axes that the part created for me um, kind of gives you, you know, the, kind of useful in some senses, but um, I just wanted to point out that it is there. If you want to kind of see more about your part, that's kind of where you go. Um, and then I guess the most important thing, save the best for last, is the feature tree here. Um, this is where all of your part information is kind of built. Starts out, if you're a member, with that new part. Um, you know, I'll just kind of exit out of this sketch here, so we don't have anything in there yet. Um, Right now, all we have are our primary planes. That's kind of wacky. Right. So we have our primary planes, front, right, top. Those are all right here. We have our origin right in the middle, that little point. Um, and then we have a couple other things. Uh, this design binder here is something that we'll talk about later. Um, it's not something you'll see by default. Um, but you'll have a little bit of control over your history. Um, and then your material is another thing. You can specify material for all of your parts. Um, and that kind of comes back to this top-down, bottom-up distinction. Top-down part, you're going to be selecting material basically for your whole part. And then you can go in, you can always individually change material of certain bodies, but kind of by default, you're setting that. And then you're going to be creating a lot of parts from different materials. You probably might want to consider a bottom-up approach. Um, but that's something that you have the option to do. You have kind of some generic ones, carbon steel, ABS, brass, copper, rubber, a couple options there. Um, and then kind of as you go through and build a part, you're going to be adding stuff to this uh, feature tree here. As you add stuff in, the way that SolidWorks computes and generates your part, it starts at the top and goes step by step down. So kind of remember that if you're going to be putting a sketch in there that you want to be critical, you want to put that in pretty early on, 
the top of your feature tree um, and build off of it down. Um, and then, you know, kind of, I guess, if you're cutting away stuff, for example, like if I were to make a block here, cut part of it out, and then add some extra, like a fillet on top of there or something else, and then I move that fillet before the cut, it's going to cut through that fillet too. So I can you know, kind of prevent a couple of things from going wrong. Um, or maybe if that geometry isn't even there, like, again, like I cut away an edge into a cube. Um, I guess I, I'll just model one real quick here just to show you guys. Um, turn off that visibility. Make a sketch on the top plane. Build a rectangle. Make both of these equal in size. We'll go super, we'll, we'll go more in depth into sketching next term or next uh, session. But for now, I'll just make a 50 millimeter cube and extrude it. 50. Cool. All right, and then we'll do that same operation. We'll make a cut on this face. Like, let's say I'll make a cut. I just want to cut out this top corner and make it like a, I don't know, make a, there we go, 10 millimeter by 15 millimeter cut out of the corner. Cut it 50 millimeters through the entire deal apart. And then I'm going to put a fillet on that edge. I'm going to make it a 5 millimeter fillet. And just so you can kind of tell that it's different from the rest of the geometry. And then I'm going to go ahead and try to move this fillet up kind of here underneath this boss extrude, the kind of the start of my cube. It's going to tell me I can't because that edge isn't going to exist yet there. So um, also if I delete this feature here, for example. No, I don't want to just delete the title. I want to delete the whole feature. Yeah, delete the whole feature. It's going to delete that fillet too. Um, again, because that kind of the, the, the fillet was dependent on geometry that was created from that cut, it's going to want me to delete that fillet too. So um, actually in the past, I believe, if I remember right, um, it actually wouldn't go through and delete that for you. It would just break your part and say, hey, this fillet, this fillet can't rebuild anymore. Um, it's going based off geometry that doesn't exist. Um, go back and fix it or you know delete the, the delete the feature yourself so it'll kind of show you those things um, actually if I undo that real quick I think yeah I'll actually show you because for some reason it's popping up all these two bars here all right there we go so showing here this is my dependent item that it's trying to delete as well um, and it's telling me hey your feature your fillet feature depends on your cut feature so you've got to delete both of them um, and one more time, one other thing that I wanted to show in here. Um, oh, I want to delete that guy. Oh, delete. Cool. I can also delete absorbed features. So if you remember that sketch that I drew for the rectangle, um, that actually got absorbed in here. So it's within this cut extrude feature. The sketch is still there. So if you remember in the steering wheel part, the sketch that I designed, if I build geometry off of it, it's going to get absorbed into. Um, one of those geometries that I build, like if I build a boss or, or something else, or if I cut with it, whatever else. Um, but if I want to use that sketch for other things, I just have to expand the feature that I use that sketch for and kind of do something with it. You know, if I want to, I don't know, I don't know what I can do with this. Maybe I want to extrude it just part way through. Um, maybe not the other way. Well, let's do like 20 millimeters, right? I can get back to that sketch, reuse it. Um, and you know, kind of navigate to it again from here. If I expand that, it's also going to show it in there. So you have multiple ways of getting to your original sketch so you don't like lose it. And you're like, all right, which feature use this, fe use this sketch first? It's going to be referenced in every single one of those. You can always go back in and edit it too. If I want to change the uh, geometry of this to 20, mil <clears throat> sorry, 20 millimeters, go in and do that. So kind of see that's a little bit deeper now. Um, any questions about the UI for SOLIDWORKS so far? Fairly straightforward? Cool. Again, just a quick review. Open up a part. You're going to be doing a sketch first. So this is where you're going to be spending your time. Once you're done with that sketch, go into features to convert it to 3D geometry. Um, and then if you have other more advanced stuff, kind of expand it inside, um, inside these toolbars here. So that's kind of what we're looking at there. Let's see. Then I guess I can show you guys an assembly too. Um, let's see if I have an assembly. 
this is something that I was using for like a training seminar, so they kind of provided me this file for me. I didn't design it, thankfully. Um, it would be a pain. Um, but you can kind of see here, you got all your different parts that make up your assembly. You have your support frame on this side. Um, you got your grill itself, upper and lower covers. You can see that they made that actually within, if it looks right, yeah, so you have a sub-assembly. So within an assembly, you can have another assembly, and then another assembly, and for so on and so forth. Um, all those assemblies are ultimately made out of, made up out of parts, but it's another thing you can do to kind of organize your parts. You can kind of figure out how much bottom up you want to do, um, and where kind of with our suspension system, for example, we're going to have an outboard assembly, so the wheel, upright, hub, all that together, and that's going to be four times around the full car assembly. So it makes sense for us to kind of sub package it and then push it out to the main assembly because all the relations are going to be the same at all those different parts. Um, and you can see that these upper and lower covers are made up of, it looks like six or seven parts here. Um, and then your toolbar is going to be different here too. So when you open up an assembly, you're going to be able to insert components. So you're put, dropping parts into the assembly. You're going to be mating them together. If you remember we talked about that, it's basically concentric axes, for example, or if two parts are right on top of each other, you make two planes coincident. Um, or, you know, if rotating around, you've got a bunch of different options. Um, smart fasteners we'll get into later. You can move stuff around too. Um, if it's allowed to move around, this shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, looks like that wasn't you know, completely fastened there. And also you'll get that same tooltip down here under define. Looks like I don't have you know, a couple of mates that probably need to exist there for, for that part to not move around. Um, with assemblies, it's usually more okay to have underdefined mates because they usually have parts moving around within your, you know, like within the car. Like suspension's going to move up and down. Um, your wheels are going to be spinning. You can fix some of that. Like you can say, hey, I don't want my suspension to move in this model, just so that as I'm moving around stuff, you know, one wheel isn't two inches up and then the other one's like an inch down. Um, you know, in, in terms of su suspension travel. Um, you can kind of say, hey, I'll just put in this angle here. It just fixes it at kind of what right height would be, for example, um, or something else. Um, there's, there's probably better ways of defining that we can get into later. But uh, in general, you want your assemblies to be as defined as necessary to prevent somebody from coming into your assembly, grabbing this part and moving it over there. You know, if you want them to be able to open and close that hinge on, that, uh, um, on your grill, um, you want to kind of add that in and not define it all the way, um, but you know, if you don't want somebody to move your whole grill top off of the off of the screen, you want to make sure that it's probably made it to the frame somehow. Um, yeah, and then you have again same kind of stuff. You get your dimensions. Um, you can actually make parts within assemblies, which is super funky. Like if we make a bunch, you know, uh, like for the chassis, for example, if we put our motors into the chassis. Um, we can actually make a mount that depends on where we put that motor in there. Um, and if we like move the motor in the assembly, it will adapt the part to it. Um, so that's kind of a little bit further on down the line. But for the most part, usually we want to have enough forward thought that you know when we go to the top level assembly, um, all the parts are already built up to that point. And they're not actually getting built in the assembly. We want to build the parts. You know, from a top down perspective, as much as we need to, then integrate them bottom up into sub assemblies and then into the full car assembly. That's usually the workflow that we go through. Um, yeah, and then also within each of these, um, like let's say here's this part here. Yeah, this corner brace right here, it's got some mates. You take a look at them. You know, as I click on it, it kind of shows me, all right, so that purple plane is touching that orange plane, I'm guessing. Yeah, it looks like a coincident mate here. Same thing here. Those two faces are perfectly in line. Those two planes are right on top of each other, sharing the space. And then same thing with that. So yeah, your coincidence is there. Um, depending on the kind of geometry you have, you might have to have different amounts of mates to fully define a part. Like that part's fully defined. If I wanted to drag it somewhere, I couldn't because it's got those three mates. It's coincident X, Y, and Z planes. I can't move around either way. Um, if it's something round, probably a little bit harder to define. You have to have a coincident or a, a concentric. So if you have like a pin going into a hole, um, you also have to define that angle too. And then also the spacing along the shaft. Um, yeah, you have a couple of different things that you know kind of go into fully defining an assembly compared to a sketch. Um,
think that's really it. And then drawings, I guess I can open up a drawing as well. I guess this part already has a drawing we can open. Uh, no, maybe not. All right. Open recent. Pull up. Mm -hmm. Shoot, I'm going to have to go pretty deep for this one. Another cool thing within SOLIDWORKS is as you open up files, you can down here, you can select if you want to just look for assemblies, uh, and just look for parts, look for all three. You know, I'm kind of trying to look for a drawing that I can open up here. So let's see what this one looks like. Oh, this one is wacky. I remember that. Um, yeah, you kind of have an exploded view here. Yeah, this is kind of what an assembly drawing would look like. You have all these different parts, and it uh, theoretically would show you kind of how to position all of those. Um, but toolbars up here, standard view view, which we talked about earlier, most common way to look at parts. Um, adding in a model view, so actually looking at a specific kind of, you know, maybe I need to add in the back of that model or something like that. Kind of same thing, exploded view, but from a different angle. And then project view, if I have a view already and I want to go off of it, auxiliary, all this kind of stuff. This is all your view layout, again, toolbar right there. Kind of shows you how you're putting all your views in the part. Annotation, again, adding those dimensions in. Model items is a super cool feature we'll talk about later. Just pulls in all the dimensions that you used in your part and just tosses them in the drawing for you. You can kind of move them around between planes if it gets too cluttered, or between drawing views if it gets too cluttered in one drawing or another. Um, and adding in notes, all that kind of stuff. Down here is another important thing. Um, this is a drawing or a sheet format. Um, it's pretty much on every single sheet to have something that looks like this that kind of tells you what the drawing is, who made it. Um, and then the important stuff, once we uh, get into PDM, is going to be right here, um, adding in our drawn by, checked by, you know, engineering and manufacturer approval. This is basically going to be your subsystem lead signing off and then the manufacturing signing off. Um, and theoretically, if we have quality assurance, like somebody going through afterwards and verifying that all the parts got manufactured right, they'd sign off on the drawing too and say, hey, this part got made properly to the, you know, to the right standards of this drawing, um, and then this drawing can get filed away. Um, yeah, you have some revision tracking here as well, um, a little proprietary note there too. Oh, that's not what I need. But yeah, so this, this is something you'll see fairly common on pretty much all drawing parts. You can get rid of it, like if you're making a, a part to go to the laser cutter, for example, get rid of that sheet format. You don't want it cutting out a you know a table and out of your wood. But um, yeah, that's kind of there in all the drawings, and you can edit that within this toolbar here too. Um, gives you a couple options for what to add in. Um, yeah, and then you can also make sketches in your drawings too. So you don't have to actually make a full uh, a full part file. You can just go in if you're just making a 2D sketch or something, a layout or something like that. You can always draw it in a drawing. Um, if it's just going to be a 2D part, and that's all it's ever going to be, you can always make it on a drawing. Uh, shoots, so we're one hour in. You guys want to take a break? Cool. <laughs> Been sitting for a while. So let's go ahead and take a break. Um, I'll come back and we'll talk for maybe like 15 or 20 more minutes. Um, and then we'll. Have you guys made the up. wheel yet? The wheel? The steering wheel? We tried. <laughs> yeah. Did you, make it, did you make it yourselves here? Did you have to just yeah. sketch something? Yeah, we tried to make it here. Um, we had the molds made somewhere else and get shipped to us. Um, and then, um, yeah, the, the molds didn't really, or the, the carbon fiber didn't really go well with the molds. So it was super rough around the edges. The geometry on the face looked fairly all right. Um, so but, it was made from, it was a lot of small pieces yeah. of carbon fiber, and you're trying to put them on. Yeah, I mean, the resin is the part that's holding it all together, so it's not that big of a deal to have a lot of small pieces, but um, the hard part was around the edges of the part. Uh, it was very, very rough and brittle and chipping away, so I don't know if we needed more layers of carbon or more resin or if it, if it was just getting old. steering wheel cover. <laughs> just manufacturing. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so when you're, when you're building parts, is there any... Would you rather look at real line on this? Like you could have just uh, made it the, the bolt holes. Yeah. Uh, it, would, it would have been the same. Mm -hmm. uh, would you rather make the bolt holes or you could have made the bases? Because uh, it, 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 like, there's no, nothing actually going to be holding the 
since yeah. it can be the bolt players later on. Yeah, so the, the tough part there is what happens if the bolt pattern changes. Yeah. You know, maybe I delete some of those bolt holes. Um, only have three bolt holes instead of four or something like that. So I, want, I always want to define or meet my parts based on what's not going to change. Um, and then you know, maybe if I know that, hey, this hole's always going to be here, I'm always going to have this bolt hole here because it connects really nicely to somewhere else, maybe I'll use that as the locating part. Um, yeah. I'm going to go grab some water real quick. I'll be right back. I just realized I wasn't even paying attention to the live stream chat. <laughs> so at least good thing. So people people are saying the stream quality looks good. So um, I was noticing on mine some of the toolbars weren't popping up, and some of the windows weren't showing on the live stream. So I'll try to figure that out by next week. Um, Got everybody back early. Oh wait, not him. Zach. I actually got through pretty much everything that I had planned out for today already. And a little bit of what I was planning on for next week, so that's pretty good. <laughs> Only in an hour. I'm just going to wait for him to get back real quick.
one back here. So, like I was saying earlier, um, kind of reviewed or kind of got through everything that I wanted to talk about today um, and a little bit of the stuff that I was actually saving for next week, which is awesome. We're moving ahead in the pace. Um, but I wanted to kind of just recap everything we talked about today. Um, so, again, the main thing that we want to think about is topology and then going into geometry. So looking at any kind of object that you might come across and trying to come up with what the topology of that looks like. You know, how many lines are there? Where are there points? Where are there planes? You know, flat uh, objects. Is there a constant cross section around things um, or through things? Um, is it a revolved part? Does it have circular geometry around some kind of neutral axis? Um, and then once we start to kind of figure out that topology, then we can start figuring out our critical dimensions, start actually turning that topology into, into geometry um, and not just the dimensions themselves, but relations. So parallel lines, um, perpendicular stuff, there's angles between stuff, there's certain dimensions or length that something needs to be, a certain hole spacing, you know, it kind of goes on and on and on. Um, so kind of an exercise for you guys to do as you're walking around before next week, try to look at objects around you. If you have nothing else on your mind, just look at an object and say, hey, what's the topology of that object? What kind of makes it, makes it up? What kind of lines would I have to draw in order to, you know, kind of, or where would I place my points? Is this a curved line, spline? Um, is that more organic? That's not actually able to be defined. Like this mouse we'll talk about once we talk about surfacing a little bit in 3D sketches. Um, there's, it, it's not very easily defined. You actually have to interpolate stuff and kind of fudge stuff almost, if that makes sense. Like you're gonna say, hey, here are these points that I know in space, and then I'm gonna try to guess at where this point should be and say, hey, it should have this kind of tangency to this other face, or maybe this kind of curvature. Um, start at this kind of angle and then merge nicely with this other angle um, in kind of a, a rational or a, the computational way, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of an exercise for you guys. Um, and then again, just to review, uh, we also talked about 3D projections. So most common way of looking at parts, top, front, and right side. From those three views, you should be able to get a pretty good idea of what the part looks like. Sometimes you have to look at the bottom, maybe the back side of a part, maybe the left side has different geometry than the right. Um, but for most basic parts, you can look at them from just three views and get a fairly good idea of what this part depends on, how to model it, what kind of topology it has. Um, and then going from there, we have the top-down, bottom-up modeling strategy. Again, that's kind of fairly theoretical, and you can do either or. There's really not, you know, it's very hard to say, hey, you should always do top-down or you should always do bottom-up. There's a time and a place for both of them. Except it's all about figuring out kind of how, you know, and with top down, you really have to consider all of your critical dimensions all in one part. Bottom up, you can kind of start to build from the bottom up um, and then kind of just consider a critical part first, go on from there. Um, but then again, then again, some of those critical parts might you know, have you know, be composed of multiple solid bodies, um, not just one, you know, one face of the steering wheel, but the other half as well within that part. Um, like with the steering wheel itself, that's a, that's a good example. So the top down was the part itself. Then I went to a, an assembly and added in a display, LEDs at the very top of it, some dials, buttons, all that kind of stuff, because I knew those parts didn't depend on how I designed the steering wheel itself. Um, you know, those parts were just off the shelf, kind of measured them, drew up a rough model of them in SolidWorks, threw them in, um, kind of threw them into the assembly afterwards and just assembled everything together to get the full completed steering wheel. The actual geometry, the parts that I was designing and coming up with um, were all on the top down kind of uh, level. Um, and then we looked at the UI, so kind of your toolbars up here at the top. Um, one other thing that's going to save you a lot of time that I'll kind of point out right now, let me go um, actually within this assembly real quick while we're here. Fun fact, hit the tab key, starts hiding parts for you. Shift tab brings them back. That's just a fun little tip out there. Um, but let's say that I open up, I'm just going to open this part here. Um, Mm -hmm. And let's say that I wanted to like, you know, I'm within a sketch, wherever else, um, and I don't want to keep dragging my mouse up here and back to the middle of the screen, up here, back to the middle of the screen. Um, kind of like with mouse gestures, you, know, you can kind of see, you know, dragging to the right brings me a circle, you know, 
if you if you kind of notice that it was fairly quick, so I wasn't able to like kind of pick out. Like I'm not used to this. Once you get used to it, it's super fast. Um, but one of the things that I really like is what we call the S key. Uh, brings up a shortcut bar right there. And again, these are also customizable, just like the toolbars up top. But SolidWorks gives you the most common things you're going to be using: your dimensions, your lines, rectangles, circles, splines, and fillets, all right here. Um, so you don't really have to move your mouse all that much. You can, get, you know, instead of going up there all the way to the top left, you just keep it right here. So remember that S key, super useful. Um, also brings up the search at the top right. So if I forget where a center line is, type it in and it pulls it right up for me. So a couple of different options there, but S key was one thing that I did want to bring up. It's going to save you a lot of time once we start sketching and uh, actually designing parts. Um, and then one more thing about the UI. So as I have multiple parts open within SolidWorks, maybe I have a part assembly, a drawing, and I want to switch between all of them, um, Alt-Tab doesn't really work as a keyboard shortcut. It's actually going to try and make me switch between all my other windows that I have open. Um, but the Control-Tab shortcut, which like in Chrome you'd use to um, <coughs> switch between tabs, works here as well. And you kind of see, kind of brings up, you know, there's my part that I'm in right now. There's the assembly that I was just in. It kind of goes back kind of to the last part or the, the earliest part that I opened up. Um, and I can switch through fairly easily. I can also tile them. So within this, there's actual sub windows. So I can tile these if it, you know, if it makes it, you know, makes it nice for, uh, come on. Uh, yes, I would like to rebuild this. And cool. So like, let's say that I wanted to look at two parts side by side. I can do that. Then if I want to bring it back to the full screen, I can do that. So there's a little bit of file, like kind of you know, multiple windows within SolidWorks built into it. Um, but I almost rarely ever use that. I'd much rather just control tab over to the part and then go back. Um, if I need to kind of look at multiple parts at the same time, that's where you find that. Um, yeah, that was really it for UI. Yeah, your UI is going to be different, sketch part, assembly, um, and or assembly part and drawing. Um, but for the most part, you got all your commands up here, your feature tree, which is your history of how you've built the part together. Um, and remember that parts are going to depend on each other. So if you're making a fillet on a, on a geometry that you made with a cut, if you delete that cut, the fillet's going to go too. Um, but if you made something that wasn't dependent on that cut, it will stay. So um, kind of have a little bit of flexibility within how you design stuff. Um, but yeah, that's really all that I had for today. Um, next week, we're going to delve into kind of further in depth into sketching parts and kind of cover all of the little, uh, all the tools that you have for sketching. Um, and we'll see, we'll kind of see how in depth we go next week might, might be a little bit on the shorter end, maybe an hour tops, but, um, yeah, so you guys have to look forward to next week. Any questions before we finish up? Cool. Where's the car? Where's the car? Yeah. You mean in SolidWorks or? Yeah. <laughs> We do have a full car assembly in SolidWorks, but it's it's way out there. What do you mean physically where the car is? Oh. Cars upstairs in EB four ninety five, physically, and then on uh, the full car model. Let's see if I can get to it right now. Might have to be PIN. Okay. So we're building, so we're building an electric one. Yep. But years ago, it was combustion. Yeah. How did that go? Combustion went fairly okay. Did you have to design your own engine? Nope. We used a motorcycle engine oh. from a Honda CBR 600. Was there like an engine size? Yeah, so we're limited by capacity, so we can't go above 710 cc's. So that one was a 600 cc engine. Get me in there. Let's see. Archive design files. Nineteen. For the steering wheel, are you guys going to put like a like a display? On yep. It? Are we still doing it? Maybe. <laughs> Instead of a dash, or also dash pages. Um, 
basically instead of a dash, the dash is going to have a few things like the main stop button, um, just because we can't really put that within the steering wheel. Well, looks like a lot of other stuff has dependencies on it. But you can kind of see all these other parts are actually open, right? Or were opened recently and still have like a, an open somewhere status, um, which is part of why we want to move to PDM so we can always access the files even if it's a previous version and not one that's opened by somebody else right now. Um, but if you kind of saw the preview as I was pulling it up, maybe you can zoom in this preview. You can kind of see we have our firewall bit that built into there, battery box, motor controllers are there, motors. Um, suspension components, um, crash structure, that's all kind of put together. All the critical stuff is in there. Outboard assembly was modded, modeled separately. Uh, maybe our full car view 1.7 hat. Yeah, you can kind of see the outboard assembly in that one. See the wheels there, other stuff, you know, driver model. How fast did you go uh, So this, the, with the rules, go within straights or straight sections of the track we try to design it around 60 miles an hour so it's a very very tight technical course um but you know you guys have a video. Uh, I was just, I was yeah we, we have a video from our combustion run in 2017. yeah um, on the web yeah and then yeah <clears throat> earlier in the lab we were watching endurance runs from very fast cars <laughs> But yeah, we kind of have, like in the past, we've had all of our you know, suspension separate, chassis here, my steering wheel. Is there like an engine limitation for the electrical cars? Yes, uh, 80 kilowatts maximum output. So they, they don't actually like constrict you on which motor you're using. They just say that your battery can't output more than 60 or uh, 80 kilowatts. Um, Under steering wheel assembly, that should open up. Let's see other parts that. Yeah, it looks like I have a couple other parts that are still open. So let me close that out real quick. Trying to figure out um, reference parts. Yeah, let's delete all these. These old files with a tilde in front of it. This basically tells SolidWorks that somebody else had opened the file. Um, that's part of the issue with using the stash as well. This is like a, a server that's hosted by uh, MKEX. Um, and if like you know we close out of one thing too fast, it'll keep you know kind of tell you that the part's still open. I mean, you'd have to depower it quite a bit. Um, fairly expensive, too, I think. Let's see. All right, yeah, there's our screen. But up the part itself, there should be. Yeah, so there's like the, a screen that I modeled, you know, with this critical stuff I didn't go through and model the full PCB and it's like, all right, here's my box header, here's where it mounts, here's the display area. And, uh, earlier I actually added in like a decal here so it'd show kind of that's what my screen looks like. Yeah, and buttons, LEDs all on the top. There's my quick release in the back. Kind of, yeah. So our plan was to put a, a connector on the back side here. There's gonna be a microcontroller inside there that would be controlled or connect to the CAN network. Just listen in. Um, and then it'll be some controls that would pull data from the CAN network and stick it on the uh, display. And then we just have to have like a four pin connector on the bottom here with you know, like the coiled wire um, so that the steering wheel can still move around, get detached, tossed out by the driver if they're in a fire or whatever else. <clears throat> yeah. All good? Cool. Yeah.
the most part, we're all done. So hopefully I'll see you all guys next week. We'll talk about sketching. Um, start to delve further into actually creating parts. But yeah, as you walk around, just take a look. See if you can think about the topography of everyday objects around you. Um, you know, start back up next week.